I recently watched Scorsese's After Hours, released in 1985 for the first time after seeing this meme on Facebook. I guess this wouldn't make sense to you if you're not a fan of HBO's Rome, but as for me, my interest in knowing where this dialogue came from led me to look this movie up. He was a consul of Rome! Within the first five minutes, the film tells you point blank that this is going to be a very weird movie. Let me ask you, does that cast here seem a little weird to you? And it doesn't disappoint. He keeps making these strange movements. By about the 40 minute mark, I couldn't believe that I had never heard of this movie before. Just throw down the keys. It's all right, be careful. That's right. Give it a good throw. There you go. Before I attempt to deconstruct the film and try to interpret what I think the film is about, let me tell you what the basic plot of the film is and what Scorsese's influences might have been while making the film. The protagonist of the film is what the film calls a word processor. Basically a person whose job is to do things like type letters, fill out forms, and make transcripts of audio recordings in 1980s era desktops. All things that have mostly been made redundant by technology today. He lives a fairly mundane life until a chance encounter with an unusual woman leads him first to chase her into the inside of a labyrinth. I love that book. Half made from the bricks and concrete of Soho after dark, close to where Scorsese grew up and half from the fears and insecurities of his own mind. Once he's inside, of course, most of the movie revolves around the protagonist trying to find his way out. Supposedly, the first 30 minutes of the film, the part that really hooks you, was heavily plagiarized from a radio monologue written by Playboy writer Joe Frank. A link to both the free stream of this film and the radio monologue it was adapted from can be found in the description of this video. Check them out if you have time. The cinematography in the movie is really interesting. Michael Ballhaus, the cinematographer, effectively used the camera to give the plot a surreal feeling. There are a number of visual scenes which almost definitely wouldn't have been in the script, but must have been added only to give the audience a sense of the protagonist's state of mind. As a man whose first viewing of the film was about 40 years after the film was made, it was interesting watching everyone interact with all of the analog technology. Besides the protagonist's occupation, people answer each other's phones out of courtesy. Hello? They will take a cab across town with only a single bill in their wallets for currency. I've only got 20. Can you break it? Yeah, sure. No problem. And if they lose that bill, they will have no way to get money but to wait until the banks open the next day. They exchange numbers without carrying any kind of booklet or device to store them in. One girl has a phonograph. This technology, antiquated even by the standards of the time the film was made, reinforces the sense of the uncanny valley that the film intends to create throughout its plot and imagery. This is definitely not a film that could easily be set in modern times, since just having a cell phone would have solved nearly all of the protagonist's problems. Yes, you know, it's very important. I've got people in there, they're expecting me. Why don't you just let me in? And having a debit card would have solved them all. There you go. Fair as a doll and a half. What? Scorsese understands what it's like to be a relatively normal-ish young man. Lately, she's been making these plaster of Paris bagels and cream cheese. Really? Yeah, she's trying to sell them as paperweights. Want to buy one? Paperweight? Yeah, I would. How much are they? The men responsible for this film must definitely have dated a number of crazy girls before making this film. I wouldn't be surprised if many of the female characters in the film weren't caricatures of a number of the production staff's bad dates. <laughs> Me too. I, I really have to tell you something before we start. Uh, 
I have never done this with a man before, and I, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> It's June. She's always here. Usually nobody notices her. A lot of the plot is a sort of morality play about the disagreeable misadventures that might occur to a young man if he chooses to go down the wrong rabbit holes. They're all trying to kill me. I mean, I just wanted to leave. You know, my apartment, maybe meet a nice girl. And now I've got to die for it, you know? The film is pretty upfront with the symbolism it chooses to reinforce this theme. It isn't a subtle message. If there is only one moral of this story, it would be, it's not just girls who need to be careful out there. The whole plot, almost from the very beginning, is an exercise in suspense and foreshadowing. There's one scene of foreshadowing in which a man hands a pair of keys with a top hat wearing skull on his keychain, supposedly a symbol of nonchalance in the face of death. The camera lingers on the keychain a few times to invite the audience to consider its meaning. Then it all becomes clear. Scorsese chose his symbolism well. The marijuana industry must have been really in its infancy when the film was made. In one scene, the two characters smoke a joint. One character comments on how it was marketed as coming from Colombia, but the second character knows what marijuana from Colombia tastes like and calls that out as a lie. By my generation, marijuana almost never had to come further than one province over, and that was only when you wanted to get the really good stuff. What type of pot is this? It's Colombian. That's a lie. What? This isn't Colombian. You can analyze the plot of After Hours as a bizarre interpretation of the hero's journey. The protagonist begins in the mundane world, experiences a call to adventure. Maybe you should come over, Paul. What? Maybe you should come on over. Sure. Sure. No? crosses a threshold guardian and passes the threshold into a sort of dark, chaotic oh underworld. He finds a helper. Come on. You want to look nice for your big date, don't you? Experiences the literal death of his guide into the underworld. Oh, God. He's confronted by an assortment of challenges and temptations, but survives. I mean, you're not going to leave now, not after I brought you in out of the rain, are you? And in the end, he atones for his sins and is transformed. Bared my soul to you. Finally, by a twist of divine fate, he's reborn and he re-enters the mundane world in a similar condition to what he once was, but changed by his experience. By retelling the hero's journey, consciously or not, Scorsese is retelling the instinctual human story of maturity, the dangers and trials of life, hope and achievement. It's the tale of the human condition. It all reminds me that, by rejecting our cultural traditions of storytelling and embracing the tropes of subversion, many filmmakers have lost their ability to make good art.